If you ever struggled writing JUnit 5 tests with Kotlin coming from a Java background, this video might be for you. Hey everyone, welcome to my channel, my name is Arho Huttunen, and in this video I will be talking about writing JUnit 5 tests with Kotlin. There are some things in Kotlin that can make your life a little bit easier when writing those JUnit 5 tests. But there are also a few things that you need to be aware of. And I'm trying to keep this as short as possible, so let's get right into it. Most of the JUnit 5 functionality works in Kotlin just like it would in Java. So here we have a super simple JUnit 5 test written in Java, where we have customized the display name with the display name annotation. If we run this test, we can see that the test name in the results is quite readable. Now let's write the same test in Kotlin. There is one neat trick in Kotlin, which is that we can use spaces in our method names if we enclose the method name with backticks. Normally this is not a recommended practice, but for this purpose it is quite handy. So if we run this test, we can see that it behaves just like before, but the code is less verbose. One thing that was added in JUnit 5 was lazy evaluation of error messages using lambdas. This avoids constructing expensive error messages unnecessarily. In Java, it would look something like this. There's nothing expensive here, but let's do this for the sake of an example. So now let's write the same in Kotlin. In Kotlin, there's a convention that if the last parameter of a function accepts a lambda, the expression can be placed outside the parentheses. So as you can see, IntelliJ IDEA suggests here that the lambda argument should be moved out of the parentheses. It's still the same, but just slightly cleaner. Any JUnit 5 assertions in Java work in Kotlin as well. Here is an example of asserting that an exception is thrown in Java. We pass the exception as a method parameter and pass a lambda inside the assert throws call. But for Kotlin, there are a couple of language-specific assertion methods that are more suitable for the language. Let's write a test with the same assertion again using Kotlin. In Kotlin, we can make this a little more readable, at least in my opinion. First, we pass the expected exception as a type argument, and then we provide the thing to be tested as a lambda. So, as you can see, it really becomes quite compact. There are several ways to write JMIT5 parameterized tests. Most of these approaches work without any changes in Kotlin as well. That being said, there is a difference when using the method source annotation. So this is how we would write this in Java, providing a static method and then passing that method name to the method source annotation. Now, if we write the same test in Kotlin, we would start by adding a companion object and then putting the arguments method there. We will be passing the method name again to the method source annotation. However, now running the test, we can see a JUnit exception saying could not find method squares. The thing here is that we have to annotate the method with JVM static so that it will be exposed as a static Java method of the test class. Using parameterized tests like this is ok, but not as convenient as in Java. JUnit 5 introduces a new programming model that allows us to generate dynamic tests at runtime by a factory method annotated by the test factory annotation. So first to get an idea what this might look like, well, let's write a test that defines a couple of dynamic tests. Each of these dynamic tests would appear as their own tests. Of course, this is not very clean and has some duplication. But there's a nice trick to make this more readable. We can use some functional mapping to remove the duplication. First, 
we'll create a map of values for input and expected values. And then we'll use the map function to map those values into new instances of dynamic test. So what this does is it takes each of the value pairs and then creates a new dynamic test for each of them. We already briefly touched static methods and Kotlin. So to make a Kotlin method visible as a Java static method, we had to create a companion object and annotate the method with JVM static. There happens to be another possible pitfall when we have to use static fields. Here we have a Java example where we register an extension in a static field. This extension will start a Jetty server in a random pod. In the test, we'll get the dynamic URL of the server from the extension and make a request to it. So doing the same in Kotlin, you would expect something like this to work. You have again a companion object and you put your extension there. However, running the test, we can see an error about the field being, being private. So it turns out we have to annotate the field with JVM field to expose the Kotlin property as a Java field. And now JUnit5 is able to see the field. All the JUnit5 lifecycle methods work in Kotlin as well. By default, the methods annotated with before all and after all need to be static. This is because JUnit5 creates a new test instance per test method and there is no other way to share a state between all tests. So that's why those methods need to be static. If we were to write this in Kotlin, we could put the before all and after all methods in a companion object and then annotate both the methods with JVM static. Luckily, it is possible to create a test instance per class instead in JUnit5 by annotating the test class with test instance lifecycle per class. This removes the requirement for static methods. Just a word of warning though, since JUnit5 is now not creating a new test class instance per test method, instance variable state is not reset between tests. If we want to use multiple extensions in a test, it's quite easy in Java. All you have to do is to add multiple extend with annotations to the test class. If we do the same in Kotlin, we will find out that the compiler complains about repeatable annotations with non-source retention are not yet supported. To work around this limitation, there is an extensions annotation in JUnit5 for Kotlin. The annotation will take instances of extend width as its arguments. This means that using multiple extensions is slightly more complex than in Java. But it's still not horribly bad and it's doable. So those were the things that I have personally encountered when using JUnit5 with Kotlin. Please like the video if you found it useful and if you are new to the channel, please consider subscribing as I will be making more videos like this in the future. Stay curious and see you in the next video.